As we embark on the holiday season, questions are raised about drinking and driving. How much is too much? Should you give blood or breath if asked by officers? And is buzz driving really drunk driving in Texas? Good evening and welcome to HGCLA's Reasonable Doubt. My name's Carmen Rowe and I'm the president of HGCLA, the Harris County Criminal Lawyers Association. We're the largest local criminal defense bar in the country. And tonight we're going to talk with DWI specialist and board certified attorney Tyler Flood and former police officer and DWI trial attorney Jim Medley. They're going to answer these questions and much more with our hosts, Jimmy Ardwan and Damon Parrish. Thank you, Carmen. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to HCCLA's Reasonable Doubt. Thank you for joining us for another episode this week. We are going to be talking DWI for the next hour, and we'll be taking your calls at around 8.30. We're also going to be taking questions via Twitter at HCCLA underscore TV. The phone number will pop up at the 8.30 mark. You can call 713-807-1794. As Carmen said, we are blessed to have two very good experts in the area of DWI law this evening. Jim Medley and Tyler Flood will be with us. But before we get to them, I want to bring in my co-host, Damon Parrish. Damon, good evening. How are you? I'm full from Thanksgiving still. <laughs> Had a really good one. And we uh, have been off for two weeks, haven't we? We have been off for a long time. I want to talk about some current events, Damon, because we've had a lot going on here the past two weeks since we've been off. Uh, I guess first and foremost in the news and on everybody's mind are the grand jury decisions in both Ferguson and New York City uh, that happened last week and then yesterday. Um, and I, I do want to announce that we are going to have a show in two weeks dedicated to uh, grand juries. We're going to be off next week, but we'll come back on the 18th and we will have a show dedicated to the grand jury process and talking about Ferguson and New York City. But Damon, I just want to get your quick impressions kind of of, of the events of the last couple of weeks. Yeah, you know, it feels like the world has changed in the last two weeks. Uh, in both cases, uh, officers uh, attacked an uh, unarmed black person, black man, and both men were killed by the officers. Of course, in Ferguson, he was shot, and uh, Eric Garner was shot in, uh, sorry, he was choked to death in New York City. In both instances, uh, the officers were investigated with internally by their own police force, and the case was presented to the grand jury. Of course, we do not know what happened to grand jury, although we know more about Ferguson and what happened in Ferguson than we do in New York. And in both cases, uh, the officers were not indicted. So we have two different uh, no indictments. And in, in New York specifically, that one's kind of unique because you actually have the entirety of the encounter on tape, um, which is pretty important evidence and still no indictment. And we've seen two varying degrees of protests amongst the locals in both Ferguson and New York City. Obviously, one was more violent than the other. Uh, nonetheless, there was protests around the country. But we'll, we'll obviously visit that and much more regarding the grand jury in two weeks. But uh, going to another point about this, kind of dovetailing off of the grand jury process and the officer process, HPD chief Charles McClellan last week announced uh, HPD body cams would be going on officers. Tell us about that. Yeah, and that came pretty much fresh off the heels of uh, when President Obama said he would like for federal law enforcement to have the same. Um, and he hopes to have within a year uh, body cams, I guess where my mic is right now, on all officers with an HPD. Now, of course, it's only limited to HPD. It doesn't include the deputies or the many constables we have, but that's still a uh, large law enforcement in Houston to have body cams. What's kind of unique about that is most HPD squad cars don't have cameras, so I'm, I'm really kind of curious how that's going to work. But if it is successful, within a year, we can see body cams on HPD officers fully documenting their stops um, and things that are happening when they encounter the public. And finally, I want to talk about Bill Cosby. Uh, these allegations keep coming around for him. Uh, this is, it seems like every five, six years or so, we get a new crop of females who come in and, and allege some sort of sexual assault against Mr. Cosby. Uh, I saw a civil suit was filed here in the last couple of days by one of the victims. And I guess, Damon, there's some questions about statute of limitations and whether or not he could still be prosecuted for some of this stuff and even whether he could be civilly liable for some of this stuff. What do you know about that? Right. In most states, and I believe Texas is one of them, um, when it comes to children, there pretty, pretty much is no statute of limitations on it. So as far as a criminal prosecution, uh, I believe the one that was a civil suit in California, she's alleging she was 15 when it happened. Uh, of course, that would make her a child, so potentially he could face uh, a charge. Now, we don't know when this happened in 1979, whether or not there was a statute of limitation at that point, or we don't know that, uh, but potentially he could face criminal prosecution. Now, on the civil side, in, in every state, 
there has to be something that makes it current, right? Uh, you can't just suit someone for something that happened 40 years ago for a civil violation that that has expired. And in this particular case, what she is saying is uh, she just now understood or realized that psychological trauma has occurred recently, uh, dating back to that sexual assault, and that will give the civil courts um, some standing to at, at least hear a suit. Whether it will go anywhere, get any traction or not, uh, you know, I, I really doubt it will. We're talking about 30, 40 year old allegations, some trace back to the 60s. Um, allegations where you just have Bill Cosby assaulted me in the studio. I mean, there's just there's not a lot of details there, of course, after 40, 50 years have passed. Uh, but in that particular suit, she's saying that she just now realized that she has psychological trauma from that assault, and that gives the civil court jurisdiction. Well, we'll be watching that. If anything comes, we'll certainly keep that in our, in our current events. Um, again, I want to remind everyone, I know we, we talked briefly about Ferguson in New York City. It's obviously a hot button issue, but we would ask that if you are going to call in and send in Twitter questions, they not be about Ferguson in New York City tonight. We're going to do that in two weeks, and please hold all your questions till then. Tonight, though, we're going to talk about DWI, and we've got two experts in DWI. Tyler Flood, who's board certified DWI lawyer, de devotes all of his practice to DWI. And Jim Medley, former police officer, who also devotes a substantial practice to, to DWI defense. Gentlemen, good evening. How are you? Good evening. I'm Thanks glad you, you yeah, you bet. I'm glad you could join us. I want to just start by giving the audience some statistics, some, some crazy statistics that I found out about DWI. Um, according to NHTSA in Texas, in 2012 alone, there were over 85,000 DWI arrests. Um, and Harris County, of course, has the highest rate, as we all know at this table. We're the largest county in the state, so it's not surprising that mm -hmm. Harris County would have the highest number. Uh, but they lead the state with o over 15,000 arrests annually. Um, also, one of the very interesting facts that, that I found in my research was that there are about 26,000 probationers in Harris County. Half of them, 13,000 of them, are on probation for DWI in two thousand. Were on probation for DWI in 2013. Huh. It's, it, it was just unbelievable to me. But I want to I want to talk with you guys a little bit tonight and and have you guys share your expertise with the audience. And and Tyler, I kind of want to start with you um, and and. Give us a little bit about your background. I see you're dressed for the holidays here with the red jacket, and, and we've got the holiday season coming upon us and, and, and Christmas parties and New Year's parties and everything else. What should people be on the lookout for, and, and, and what should they kind of understand about the process if they're caught up, in it, caught up in it this holiday season? Well, I was told not to wear any blue or green, <laughs> so this is the result. Thanks for having me. Just to clarify, I'm board certified in criminal defense, but okay. State Bar of Texas, not... Um, officially board certified in DWI. That's a pretty uh, contentious title. I want to make sure that's clear gotcha. for the record. So, um, so my background is I've been practicing for about 13 years and uh, somewhere along the way I decided to focus more on DWI. Um, as you've indicated and noticed, there is a lot of it, unfortunately, for the community. Um, we're not uh, opposed to these laws. I think they're good laws. Being born and raised in Houston, these are the same streets that I drive on and uh, have two boys, but you know, we're not here and we don't um, defend people in defiance of these laws. They are there for a reason, but there are, uh, what, what motivated me to take an interest in DWI was the fact that the punishment, I think, is too severe. Uh, for almost every single offense that you can commit in the state of Texas, you can receive what's called deferred adjudication, which is a form of probation where there's no conviction resulting. Uh, that's not so for DWI. So Mothers Against Drunk Drivers has done an excellent job. They've been very effective at lobbying over the past several decades. And now it's to the point where even a first offender, a person who has a few drinks, um, they may not even be intoxicated. They drive down the street or pulled over. An officer smells the alcohol on their breath, and they've already made up their mind that they're going to arrest them. And you know what? Any plea bargain results in a lifelong conviction that follows you around forever. So. Um, we've kind of become the product of the jurisdiction and, or the laws of the state of Texas. I think that if you found that if deferred adjudication was offered for um, DWI ever again, it may change a lot of people's uh, law practices. But so That's true. Jim, I, I want to ask you, as a former law enforcement officer, what should people be on the lookout for from, from police this holiday season? Well, typically during the holidays, you know, the police are going to be out in greater numbers um, especially during the times that are uh, 
more higher risk, you know, where people are drinking weekends after midnight, uh, things like that, where officers are going to be in places where officers call, uh, you know, watering holes or honey holes where they know where uh, a lot of people are going to be driving, leaving bars, and, you know, they stop a lot of cars. Sometimes no. they just follow people out of parking lots. Yeah. So you would expect, uh, Jim and Tyler, especially Tyler, a lot of traffic as far as police near Washington Avenue, near uh, Heights, near Rice Village, anywhere where there's a large population or uh, a, a large population of people and a tight collection of, uh, of liquor establishments. Absolutely. The officers that, that specialize in DWI arrests, that's typically just where they patrol. When they make an arrest, they'll go to the jail, bring their prisoner in, and they'll go straight back out to Washington, one of those places where they know, you know they're going to see someone else who's been drinking, most likely. Now, guys, we've seen commercials on TV, I'm sure everybody's seen it, where they have these checkpoints. They have the, the ghost officer and the person is in a car and it's filling up with alcohol as they're driving down and you know they're always watching you and they get pulled over at some checkpoint. I mean is that is that really the reality we're facing here in Houston? Are there DWI checkpoints set up around this town? Well there there are not really and they're not technically uh, legal however I've heard some rumblings where uh, so my paralegal was able to kind of um, she attended a police officer <clears throat> uh, seminar a couple weeks ago in Austin um, they didn't ask her where she worked, and she was able to um, sit there through all of uh, the lectures from law enforcement and prosecutors. And, and there's a conscious effort to try to legalize the checkpoints. Um, have you ever heard the term wolf pack? They said that we're not, we're not doing um, checkpoints, but it's more of we're targeting certain places, and they called it kind of a wolf pack when we're ganging up and focusing on certain places. Bars and restaurants. Bars and sort of restaurants. Thing. Honey holes. <laughs> um, well, in in that regard, in terms of the targeting, uh, is there is there a way for people to kind of avoid this altogether? Well, Jim, what are the tips that you guys advise for people to avoid this altogether? Uh, the first obvious one is take a cab, right? Right. I mean, that's that's the simple, almost ridiculous answer is you know don't drink and drive. Yeah. Um, or don't drive at all because sometimes you know people get arrested and get charged with DWI if they haven't been drinking. You know if they're, they're found to have some kind of prescription medication in their purse or in their vehicle and they don't do well in the field sobriety test, they can still find themselves going to jail for a DWI when they haven't had a drop. So, you know, drinking and driving isn't necessarily the elements they need. And let's talk about that. What what are the elements that the state has to prove in order to convict someone of DWI in Texas? Well, there's three ways. Um, not having the normal use of your mental faculties, not having the normal use of your physical faculties, and then having a um, .08 or higher BAC at the time of operating, at and, the time of driving. And can that be by either breath or blood? Breath or blood. Um, doesn't have to just be alcohol either. It can be alcohol or drugs. It can be, um, there can be zero alcohol and still be um, guilty of DWI because of drugs. And that's a common misconception. A lot of people ask, well, why weren't we charged with DUI or how can I be charged with DWI if I didn't have anything to drink at all? Now, I want to go back to the definition of mental faculties and physical faculties because I'm often accused by, of my wife for sure of not having my mental faculties uh -huh. and often by some people of not having my physical faculties and I can assure you I haven't been drinking. Uh -huh. So um, <laughs> what, are some, what are some examples of the loss of normal use of your mental and physical faculties? Well, um, or that a, that a prosecutor might argue is the loss of normal use. Or that a, a cop might look for when they pull you over for a loss of physical faculties. What, what are some indicators? Well, Jim's got that experience. He's probably best suited to answer what he would look for when he would make those stops. Well, uh, as we normally and often argue, you know, in court, uh, officers are looking for anything that's not perfect. You know, anything the person does that might indicate that they don't have perfect command, you know, of their balance, of remembering, you know, all the details about sometimes they ask their social security numbers, things like that, that, you know, people who are under stress, people who are nervous, people who may be tired, you know, someone who stopped at 2 in the morning that might work that day, been up since 4 a.m. You know, there's lots of things that could cause someone to not have what we think of as perfect mental or physical faculties, but, you know, officers at certain times of night are going to make some assumptions when they see people make, people make simple mistakes. Now, how do the officers create, a, I guess, a baseline for individual perfection of a person not knowing that person. I mean, how do you know the person isn't just clumsy because they're clumsy and they don't know they're social because they just are bad with numbers or dyslexic? Like, how do, how, how do, how do officers deal with that? Is there a, a way they deal with that? They don't know. Um, some officers may go through the extra trouble of asking some simple questions like, you know, do you have epilepsy? Do you have diabetes? Um, but typically those, all, those questions are only used to try to diffuse possible defenses later. They're not truly and um, genuinely trying to inquire you know, if that person has an issue. They're just trying to, to 
you know, um, to get the case ready, insulate their arrest from defenses. So yeah. if an officer pulls someone over and they suspect that you're intoxicated, do you, is it your belief that that person will probably just be arrested and no matter what happens at that point, that they're going to be arrested for DWI? Or do you actually believe that they truly investigate? And, and I know some people are different and there, there are some exceptions. This is, this is more, uh, not the rule, but do you believe that uh, once pulled over and investigated for a DWI, at that point you're getting arrested? If they simply have the smell of alcohol or the admission of drinking or they've watched you leave a bar, um, few officers are going to let somebody just drive away if they've shown any really in, imperfections in you know, the way they've responded to the officer or behaved on the traffic stop. You know, and you talk about that in trial too, in defending somebody, that a DWI is an opinion case of lots of times just one officer. So you can frame it with a jury in terms of what, as a public policy, it's not a good idea for that officer to let that person keep driving. So you get the jury thinking, well, that's right. Maybe that doesn't mean that that person is guilty. They just have to have probable cause to make an arrest, which is the same level of proof as to write a traffic ticket. It's much lower than beyond a reasonable doubt. So um, you can start off getting the jury or uh, potential jurors to think that that's right. We, we wouldn't want the officer to just let somebody go if we smelled alcohol on their breath because we just don't really know. So many times um, you, can, you can get the, the idea in a, a juror's head that they're taking them off the street um, and, um, for, for safety reasons, but they're the ones that still decide now whether or not they have enough evidence to prove they're guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. And it's just that person's opinion. And, and the officer, I haven't had, I don't think any officer ever argue with me when I say, you know, just the fact that you made an arrest, that doesn't mean that they're guilty of DWI. And they'll say, no, absolutely not. We're talking tonight with Tyler Flood and Jim Medley, talking about DWI. Please send us your questions to at HCCLA underscore TV. We'll answer them in about, start answering them in about 15 minutes. We'll also start taking your phone calls at 713-807-1794. Guys, one of the big questions that every lawyer gets, and it doesn't matter whether you're a criminal lawyer, a civil lawyer, a family lawyer, is always, if I'm pulled over, should I take the breath test? Now, there's been a lot of changes over the last decade with blood warrants and mandatory blood draws, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, but sticking to that question, uh, as we sit here in 2014, the current state, the way things are, what do you, what do you guys answer to that? Is there one standard answer even? I, I think there used, to be, there used to be one standard answer, and it was don't blow. Um, because they would not take your, your blood. And so then you had a case where there was no BAC. That was pretty simple. And it wasn't that long ago, relatively. Um, now the answer has become a little more complicated. So there's not a one-size-fits-all answer. Um, I do know that probably telling people to go ahead and blow isn't the proper answer because sometimes um, they can't draw blood and they might be threatening that they're going to if you refuse a breath test but they just don't do it um, there are many other counties other than just harris county in this state and they're not set up to take blood as they are uh, you know they're very well equipped in harris county so it's not as clear cut anymore but i think the best way uh, and jim i'm sure has his own take is is inform everybody you know and let them make up their own mind but if um if you, if you are trying a DWI and the, the average juror comes in thinking that the, a breath test is much less reliable than a blood test. Um, and then it's our job to educate them that there can be as many or more problems with blood draws actually than a breath test. But that's the way they come in seeing that. So if you had to choose right off the bat, you, some people would say it's easier or uh, more defendable to defend a breath test case. But if you refuse your, uh, a breath test now in Harris County, uh, more times than not, they're going to obtain a warrant and draw your blood. So we, you know, this year I think we've tried more blood draw cases than ever before, and I don't see it um, see it really changing. Well, so, and the reason for that is because now every day is every day is no, no refusal. refusal, right? And that's a. I'm glad you brought that up. They they advertise no refusal weekends on holidays, and they'll put some money out there to um, to hit it in in big times holiday season, um, but it's every night. And people aren't aware of that. Every night they can they are set up to draw your blood if you if you refuse a breath test. And, and if they're not if they can't take it down at um, the police station, they'll take you to a hospital and have a nurse do it there. And that is in Houston, uh, in Harris County. They're, they're Harris set up County. for that. What about the surrounding counties? Fort Bend, Montgomery, Galveston, Brazoria. What what's the state out there with regard to the resources that they have for no refusal? Yeah, I think Montgomery County is pretty close to Harris County. I'm not sure so. about some of the others. I think. Um, Galveston County is a little more resistant to judges feeling comfortable 
signing, you know, warrants 24-7 on every, you know, simple first-time DWI case, you know, authorizing officers to go out and have people stuck with needles. Uh, at least I know that was the last time I read about Galveston County. Uh, I'm not sure if Brazoria County was doing it in every case either, but I, I do believe Montgomery County and Fort Bend County are probably pretty close to Harris County's policies. Okay. And, and guys, I have a, a two, two questions for you, actually. Uh, the first one was you mentioned in, in, in informing and knowing your rights. So if you're pulled over for suspicion of DWI, and do you have a right to refuse a breath test? Do you have a right to refuse a blood test? And if you do refuse, what happens? Um, and then my next question is generally, when you interview your clients, you get clients, what does the average person who's accused of a DWI look like? I mean, are we, or is it the slosh person who's fallen over that the media kind of picks, just can't stand up straight? Or is it a person kind of like us right now that looks sober, probably is sober, uh, or <laughs> certainly acts sober, uh, but, but just maybe .09, and that's enough. So uh, first question would be, can you, what are your rights as far as a stop, breath test, blood test? Second question, what is your average uh, person charged with a DWI offense look like? Well, you do have the right to refuse. Um, you can't refuse a blood test, though. Uh, they can't force you to blow air out of your lungs. They can't, they don't bear hug you and squeeze your stomach and make air come out into the breath test machine. That's ridiculous. But um, they will strap you down into a chair that looks um, like a crazy, like electric chair looking thing um, and physically take your blood. You cannot refuse a blood test. And I know Jim had a, a case that got some media attention a, a while back where they they really handled his client and, and drew his blood. So, yeah, you can't really refuse a blood test. Yeah. Uh, and then my next question, what does your average person who's intoxicated look like? I mean, is it sloshed or is it normal? What, what, what do they look like? You mean their level of intoxication? Yeah, I mean, when you see them, if you were to, when we imagine a person driving drunk or when the media creates that person driving drunk, they create somebody who is just clearly intoxicated, a person who can't stand up straight, can't walk straight, can't talk straight. Is that the average looking person on the road driving uh, charged with intoxication or is it somebody who is, looks and acts as normal as we are, in which case they may be, not be intoxicated, just .09? I say no. I think that the, the the most common appearance that we see with people who are arrested is uh, someone where their, their, their appearance is, is an area of, of gray area. You know, it's an area that can be argued either way. Uh, we're dealing with people, like I mentioned earlier, who may be uh, tired, could be, uh, you know, like, like any of us suffering from different kind of physical conditions that may cause us to not appear to be the perfect, perfectly balanced, perfectly gathered mentally person. Um, of course, when people do consume alcohol and it's enough to affect their brain, then you know even that situation goes down from there. But I'd say more people look, um, it's arguable one way or another, than people who are just you know hands down, just clearly you know trashed. Okay. Right. I think they look like you, like you, like you, like me. That's I think the average is is you're educated, um, working. Um, you know, younger-ish person, lives in the city, um, but there are the extremes as well. Right. So you get a lot of oil executives, um, but it's, it's pretty upstanding people of the community most of the time. And I want to ask you about that because I, I remember a time years ago when a lot was made and there was actually, I can recall, a, a, an article in the Chronicle pointing out that a lot of these officers and a lot of the DWI task force officers particularly would hang out in the Westheimer area, in the mm -hmm. Post Oak area, in the, in the higher income areas, so to speak, um, and, and would hang out on the west side of town. Mm -hmm. uh, and they would, they would pull over that. And the, the reason being, and, and those of us in the defense world remember, uh, was because oftentimes they knew that those clients had the resources to fight cases, take them to trial, which mm -hmm. would get overtime pay for the officers. Right. Is that still going on? What have you seen with that? I haven't seen signs of as, as much abuse of that as was going on probably five, six, seven years ago. Um, but, you know, I've been in situations where uh, I was at a hearing one time where I hold, heard an officer talking to another officer in a waiting room and the officer was bragging that he had towed four Aston Martins in one week. <laughs> but, I mean, even, even today, though, they're targeting the Washington area in Houston. They're targeting the Midtown area of Houston. In, in, in Montgomery County, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm sure they target the, the Woodlands Town Square and same with mm -hmm. Fort, Bend, uh, Fort Bend where they target the Sugarland Town Square. I mean, the, these are areas where 
people are going to spend money. I mean, you're, you're talking about going to bars where people are paying seven, eight dollars a drink. They're they're ten dollars just nice, to get in. The yeah. ten dollars just to get in, paying for nice dinners. To to some degree, is the is the targeting still alive, but maybe not the overtime abuse. I, I think they target. It, it's common sense to target places where there's a high concentration of bars. Washington has that. Market Street in, in Montgomery County has that. So it's um, it's less work and easier pickings, I guess. But you know, you got to face the fact that um, officers they take on extra jobs to make more money and support their family. Uh, they can earn an, an incredible amount of extra income by um, being in court, just sitting there. And even in Houston, there's a, a liaison room, is what they call it, down on the in the basement, with couches and TVs and coffee machines and donuts and you know. Every officer that um, is set for trial and they receive a subpoena, that case may be reset five times, but they'll show up and they'll check into liaison, go to sleep on the couch, and they're making overtime just for being there. So there is still the potential to, um, I mean, you know, I, I wouldn't call it abuse because they're required to be there by subpoena. They show up and they're, they're doing their job. But I agree with Jim. It was being abused pretty bad so, um, a while back, but I don't really see that uh, <laughs> flagrant anymore. <laughs> Jim, from a from a police perspective, uh, what I, I guess the when you are looking for signs of somebody on the road driving, what's the first thing you look for if if you are let's say a DWI task force officer? I mean, you're not out there looking for people speeding. You're not looking for. I mean, you're you're a DWI task force, so you're you're keen to observing DWI offenses. What are the first things that an officer like that's going to look for? Um, I mean, you're spot on. I mean, time is money, even for the task force officers. They don't want to sp spend two hours of their night on five-minute traffic stops where they're stopping somebody who's clearly not drinking and having to say, okay, sorry, you know, check their license and get back on their way. They'd rather every stop to be something that's likely to turn into an arrest. That's the best use of their time. So certainly if an officer is driving down the road and they see a car that's speeding and they see a car that drives six inches over the line, they're going to stop the car that goes six inches over the line, even though they could legally stop either car. And either car could involve somebody who had been drinking, but you know the one that's showing something that's more arguable as a potential sign of intoxication, of course, is going to be the better bet for them. Did yeah. you just see that picture I put on my Facebook of that officer going across the line? I didn't. He, we were driving downtown yesterday, and there was a, a motorcycle cop that stopped right next to us way past the line, and we just snapped a picture of him. And we had another client that was just pulled over for that exact same reason. If you stop past the line, that's reason for them to stop, and those turn into DWI investigations all the time. But it was just kind of funny seeing the officers do that. I want to ask about a, a current case where the officers brought us some stuff. This was, this was in today's news. Um, there was a judge, a 13th Court of Appeals judge who was arrested in July. Uh, Judge Nora Longoria, and she was arrested July 12th. She was arrested for going 69 in a 55. She failed field sobriety test, refused a breathalyzer, and she even showed her judicial badge and asked the cop to let her go home. Uh, the case was dismissed today, um, and the, the prosecutor in that case said, and I quote, she wasn't stopped for weaving, she wasn't stopped for anything other than speeding. It's just an officer's opinion. He goes on to say, <clears throat> I look at whether they are sitting upright and oftentimes video disputes claims of slurred speech. There may be alcohol, but that does not convict a person. I mean, have you ever heard that come out of that phrase come out of a prosecutor's mouth that and, alcohol doesn't convict a person? And, and Jimmy, not just a prosecutor, we're talking about the DA. The DA himself he in Hidalgo elected County. The DA to say that. And I thought that was pretty awesome. I mean, yeah. Well, Hidalgo County, they're much more tolerant of DWIs <laughs> uh, than Harris County, but I find that to be very hypocritical, and I'd like to issue a subpoena for that prosecutor at our next trial and have them come in and explain that those signs don't equal intoxication. <laughs> Do you think there was any political favors being done by the fact that this was a 13th Court of Appeals judge in mm. this, in this instance? Know. Can you, I well, mean, is that just... How about this? Am I reading too much into it? No, no, of course not. But do you think there's any truth to what he said? I mean, is it true? It, what he said, is that actually true for DWI offenses, or do you think he exercised favor to get her off? Oh, I think it's absolutely true. That's what we raise all the time and argue and point out to the jury and that um, these signs don't necessarily prove a person is intoxicated. They, 
prosecutors sometimes want to require perfect performance on these awkward balancing tests that, you know, we're, we're trying to measure what is um, normal mental and physical faculties, and the way we're doing it is with very unnormal and unnatural tests. Some people call them roadside gymnastics, but there's nothing normal about balancing on one leg, holding your hands by your side, l pointing your foot, looking down, counting to 30 seconds, or walking nine steps heel to toe, pivoting your foot, turning, using a series of small steps. Nobody practices these, but they're being used to, uh, to determine what, if a person has their normal physical and mental faculties. So I think those statements were pretty accurate. Yeah, I agree. It's 8.30. We're going to take your phone calls at 713-807-1794. We're also going to start answering Twitter questions at HCCLA underscore TV. And I think we have our first call of the night. Uh, hello. Welcome to HCCLA Reasonable Doubt. I guess we don't have a call. Oh. Or do we? Hello. Hello? Hello. Hi. Hi, I was wondering um, how scientific are those soul sobriety tests? I'm sorry, we can't hear you very well. Could you repeat the question? I was wondering how scientific are those field of sobriety tests? Sure. Tyler, how, get a, well, you got a thought on that? Get each of y'all's thought on how scientific there, those are. There's a practitioner certification course that you can take to become um, trained in how to administer and the history and the science behind these well, tests. Uh, and Before we do, I, I don't know if the, if the audience can hear a question. Jimmy, if you no. just repeat what she said and then that way we can... We sure. Can. Her, the caller's question was how scientific are the field sobriety tests? I'm going to defer that to Jim. Jim's actually the, uh, taught the course that I took when I became originally certified and Jim knows a lot about the science behind it. So. The uh, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration created basically a, a company to produce you know, research statistics and called the Southern California Research Institute back in the 70s. Um, they started conducting some experiments that were very secretive about the actual data. Uh, they were very selective about what kind of data they put into the literature that are circulated to police officers. Uh, some, of that, some of those conclusions, some of that data is actually completely false. Um, they continued doing some more experiments using actual arrest data in the 90s. Um, in fact, uh, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, in just the manual it released last year, started quoting some uh, statistics that they claim they produced in a study that was done 15 years ago. So that's, that's hard, how far behind uh, what officers are presented with. But um, none of these studies that the, the government uses have ever been subjected to what's called scientific peer review where other scientists who don't have, you know, a vested interest in the outcome of the numbers look at the, the research methodology and, you know, give, a, give an okay and say, yeah, this is scientifically sound. Um, the government has never subjected their research to that kind of scrutiny, and uh, it shows in the numbers that police officers are given to come into court and parrot um, when they really haven't even read the, the true studies. Now, Tyler called them roadside gymnastics. I've, I've heard them called a, a number of other things. Mm -hmm. but. Um, what what are the field sobriety tests? What, what what are they? What do they entail? What what they require a person to do? Well, if you ask a police officer that, you know, that's usually you know, one of the first questions a, a prosecutor would ask an officer in trial. And the first thing the officer is going to say is, well, these are divided attention tests. Uh, in theory, with the field sobriety test, at least the, the ones that involve physical faculties, the walk in the line, the stand on one foot, um, those tests give a series of instructions to a person and the uh, the officer assesses how well that person is both performing the physical tasks of doing what was asked of them as well as how well they retain the instructions. So it's uh, by dividing attention, um, the way they're balancing and moving as well as the way they're remembering what they were told. I think we've got an example of, of some going on our screen right now. Well, Tyler, uh, get a, That was uh, not supposed to show up. <laughs> um, that was an example of a, a felony DWI that um, the trooper demonstrating the test had much more difficulty balancing than my client who was attempting to perform them. The uh, uh, trooper had to hold it against the wall and then he actually fell over when he was just trying to demonstrate. <laughs> I did notice that. So that case did not go to trial. It went away. I, I wanted to add something on the science that, to answer that question. The, the, the original studies, these tests are based on a .10 BAC and they haven't been, um, there's no new studies uh, with the lower .08 and um, officers, though, commonly will testify that they're applicable still to the lower uh, tests, right? They, they do. Um, and, and in defense of that position, you know, the, I think the way they look at it is, well, if people, you know, supposedly fail the test at a certain level mm -hmm. when it was .01, and now that the limit's .08, if people are showing those same signs, then they must obviously be 
over 0.08 because they failed the test at the 0.01 or 0.10 criterion. So that can be rationalized, but it's not what the research actually says. You know, the, the studies were done very differently from the 70s to the 90s, and uh, it's, it's very misleading the way the, uh, the information is presented in court oftentimes. Punishment is rather stale. I think we got a video up right now showing of the one leg stand. Um, that's, that's, that's one of the more acrobatic moves yeah. that they require you to do, isn't it? That was an interesting misdemeanor. Then the guy said on camera, man, these are really hard. I haven't been working out. These are really hard to do. And they are hard to do, but you saw he hops all around the entire room and looked pretty ridiculous. But um, the jury felt that those tests were just challenging to do and they didn't necessarily prove intoxication. How, how often do you, you guys use a client's medical and uh, physical you know, background where they've had sports injuries or something like that? How much, does, how much can you use that to help defeat an officer's allegations that, that a client failed the field sobriety test? I think that, that's a big factor. It plays a, a big role. Questions that we always ask when, when we're um, talking to our clients is, have you ever suffered any broken, you know, broken bones? injured legs, feet, anything that could potentially affect your balance. And then if they say yes to you, it's like the next question is then, okay, did you express that to the officer when he was investigating you at the scene? Because um, it's hard to come back afterwards and say, oh, now I have an injury that affected my balance. But a lot of times, um, you know, officers should, as a good practice on their investigation, ask those types of questions before they begin the test. And if there truly are things that would uh, come into play, um, hopefully that person will tell the officer but we, we do ask about medical background, uh, subpoena medical records all the time. If there are any, um, any things that could affect uh, what the officers are looking for that would not be attributed to alcohol. Um, for instance, concussions or trauma to the eyes. Um, you know, they're looking for the jerking of your eyes when they're doing the HGN test. And sometimes there are physical conditions that can cause that jerking that's not attributed to alcohol. So medical conditions are very important. We have a, a Twitter question coming in. We have, just for you guys' edification, we have a watch party from Midnight Slice that watches us every time wow. they very, get together. Very loyal viewers. Yeah, they are very loyal viewers and they always tweet in. And so the question coming in tonight is they want to know, what's the percentage of overall people who pass the field sobriety test? <laughs> um, very, very low, <laughs> very low. Uh, I would say way under 10%, but yeah, that's a tough question. I mean, it, anybody, even if they hadn't had anything to drink, um, they're probably not going to pass those tests. And, and Jim, is that, is that more of an officer situation that once they've got you in their, in their grasp, they're going to find a way to fail you on those tests? Well, yeah, I mean, the word pass kind of creates a loaded question because the officer decides what pass is. Now, there are some objective criteria that the officer is supposed to use, and when everything's on video, that helps us a lot because when there's no video, the officer can say pretty much what they want. Uh, but whenever there is everything on video, sometimes we have legitimate questions of whether a person did, in fact, show one of the signs on the test that officers, you know, say are part of their decision to decide the person failed when they really didn't even show that proper sign. Uh, um, speak, speaking of signs, what do they look for? So let's take, for instance, the uh, walk and turn test. And I believe that's the one where you take nine heel to toe steps and like your hands are glued to your hips and your back straight. Uh, then on the ninth set, you do like a series of, of, of small steps to kind of pivot around, correct? And you walk back. What do, what do they look for to establish a, a, a pass or more importantly, a failure? Damon, that's a great question. Um, officers are trained that there are eight what they call validated things that a person can do when they perform that test. And if they don't do them according to those criteria, the officer is supposed to consider that a, a sign of intoxication or what they call a clue. Um, do you, there's, there's eight of them that on the walking, on the walking test. Um, do you want me to go through them? Yes, yeah, please. I'm okay. Please. <clears throat> the first thing the officer does is put this person into a, condi a position that challenges their balance, an unnatural position where they put their left foot on the line and they put their right foot touching the heel of that left foot to the toe of the right foot on that line. So just right there we know that this position is designed to challenge imbalance from the start. It's designed to cause imbalance. It's designed from the start to cause imbalance. So you start the test off already at a huge disadvantage. Yes, and you okay. can't use your arms. The officer is supposed to instruct the person to put their arms down at their side. Then the officer tells them, don't move. Hold that position. Stand just like that until I finish giving the rest of the instructions. Then, depending on which officer you're dealing with, the officer can take as long as they choose to, to, to give the instructions in the test, to require the person to stand in this position. Um, you know, if an officer is slow talking or very repetitive, you know, the person can end up having to stand there for a couple of minutes. 
Whereas if the officer gives the instructions exactly like they're trained to do it, they should only have to stand there for about 35, 45 seconds you know, before they should then begin walking. So there's a lot of subjective influence that an officer, the way they conduct the instructions, can affect the person's performance. And then while they're standing there, if there's any sort of sway on your part, is that a failure or do the tests allow for swaying to catch your balance in this, in this purposefully designed, unnatural and unbalanced position? Well, from a very technical perspective, the officers are told that if the, per if the person has to move their feet in any way to catch their balance or if they move their feet just randomly, they consider that a sign or par part of the criteria to fail the person. Right. Well. Um, often officers will consider f swaying in that position as a sign even though that's not one of the validated signs they're trained to count against the person. Jim, one of the questions coming in on Twitter asks, should we refuse the field sobriety test? And I want to add, expound upon that. Can you even refuse the field sobriety test? Uh, th that's a great question. Uh, there is no uh, implied consent law with regard to field sobriety tests. There's no requirement that someone participate in them. Um, the, the reality is, you know, if an officer requests the test and a person exercises their absolute right not to do them, they're most likely going to get arrested anyway. Although, you know, the state would have a much much less evidence to try to pursue a prosecution with. Uh, the officer would have less evidence to try to obtain a search warrant with. Um, you know, refusing the field sobriety test is probably not going to get someone sent on their way. But there is no law in any way in Texas law, and actually, I mean, there's an absolute right to decline to participate in the standardized field sobriety test um, under Texas law. Could somebody record it, for instance, with all the cell phones that are out there? I mean, Damon alluded to the fact earlier when we were talking about the HPD body cams that not even all the cars have uh, videos in them. I mean, if, you, if you've got a passenger, if you've got a phone on you can, you, can you offer the officer your phone to let him record your, your field sobriety test? I think Tyler's actually you know, had a case involving an officer that didn't like a <laughs> client recording something. Well, they, I, I've had... Um, bystanders friends record mm -hmm. and um, that so they can do that uh, officers don't like that if they see that but we had a trial a couple weeks ago and, and I've started asking this all the time if they don't have a camera um, to video it I, I start out saying what kind of phone do you have and and if it has the capability of taking pictures and making videos everybody's phone does these days and I yeah. say okay well you said you didn't have a camera in your car um, the best evidence is visual evidence that the jury could see what you're saying. Did you, did you use your phone to record these tests? And they, they all say no. And, and the answer I received this last trial was, it's our policy. They won't let us use our personal equipment to record any of that. <laughs> so, Not surprising, frankly. Now, Tyler, you brought some good little props with you tonight that we have here. And I kind of want you to explain what you brought for us. These little well, I didn't know if stocking you stuffers for the holidays. Yeah, well, this is our fun little toy. This is a PBT portable breath testing device. Um, this is not admissible as evidence in court. The only thing that is, as far as breath test evidence goes, is from the Intoxilizer 5000, that big hunk of junk, a uh, piece of metal sitting over there. It looks like it's from the 70s. But um, troopers will use these at the roadside just to tell if a person has had anything to drink, and they'll use it to determine if there's probable cause for an arrest. But whatever, so this is a breath test device, and whatever a number shows up is just merely to see if you've consumed some alcohol. But the thing that, uh, about breath testing is very sensitive. It, it's supposed to measure only deep lung air. Not, what, does that, what does that mean, deep lung air? Just um, the... the um, the air, it's called alveolar air, but it's um, a more reliable measurement of the alcohol that's in your, in your blood, in your body, from deep inside your lung, as opposed to what's in your mouth. You don't want to measure mouth alcohol. Um, so if you take a, a um, breath test, there's a 15-minute observation period where the officer has to ensure that you don't drink any alcohol, you don't cough, you know, vomit, put any tobacco, anything in your mouth, chew gum. Um, anything that could potentially skew the, uh, the breath test result to be higher. Um, and they say that after 15 minutes that any residual mouth alcohol should be gone from your mouth and that won't interfere with the breath test and it would be measuring only the deep lung air. But um, I wanted to do a demonstration to show you how significant mouth alcohol can skew a result. And I was going to um, blow on this to show you um, a baseline and then swig a shot of Jack Daniels and um, spit it out into a cup and then blow again and let you see what the result is. We've never done a demonstration here on Unreasonable Doubt, but you will be the first one, so I say go for it. All right. So it's just heating it. It's okay, saying blow. Okay. 
Okay, it clicked. Hopefully it'll say zeros, which it does. So no alcohol, okay? Zeros. Sober, Zero. baseline. Zeros. So where did that go? Uh -oh. Here we go. The good Daniels, stuff. Right, yeah, I got the good stuff. Plastic bottle. Cleans the pallet out too. Oh, okay. That's a good jack right there. Did not swallow it. I'm not a big uh, whiskey drinker to begin with. So then I'll blow again. No deep lung air, not intoxicated, but let's see what it says. I mean, no. It's really thinking hard because there's a lot of alcohol. You and stumped it, the machine. It might come back with an error message because it's so high. It's still thinking. Yeah, it says error. That means that it was so far off the charts that it won't even register, that it was impossible to have an alcohol reading that high. So most, more, <clears throat> more importantly, it didn't register a zero. It didn't register a zero. It, it says that I'm completely this. intoxicated. You know, that on a scale they say that 0.4, um, you would be dead. So this is saying that you're way over any possible physical level of alcohol intoxicated. Right. That's, how, um, that's how if you don't wait the proper 15 minutes on, on those machines, it can skew the results and it can show you how unreliable the breath test machines can actually be. We've got another call. I want to go to the caller. Hello, welcome to Rachel Still A Reasonable Doubt. Hello? Hello? Hi. What's your question? Um, so can employers discriminate against a DWI? Hmm. We are not employment lawyers <laughs> <laughs> around here, um, so I'm not sure that we could really answer that question. I mean, historically, guys, what have you seen with your clients and how they've been treated by their employers after dirt both during the arrest period and after a conviction? What have you historically seen? My experience has been <clears throat> that you know the, the laws in Texas are pretty um, pretty in favor of employer rights to employ who they want to to continue to employ who they want to so um, unless you know someone has a specific contract providing the terms of their employment the terms of their termination um, generally again I'm you know I'm not an employment lawyer either but just generally my experience having done this for so long uh, and talked to you know lawyers and done research on this issue because almost every client has the question um, if an employer sees that you've been so much as arrested for DWI and not convicted, maybe you can go to trial later, you beat the case, get it dismissed, but you know, an employer can pretty much terminate somebody for whatever reason they want or no reason. So if an employer finds out about just an arrest, an accusation, a person could end up losing their job over a DWI situation. And, and certainly <clears throat> if you have a uh, commercial driver's license or if you drive for a living, you will face some sort of stiffer punishment for a DWI offense, I imagine. Right, then you're disenfranchised from not only that employer that had you, but from being able to work in your profession for at least a period of time. Uh, I want to talk to you about, we recently, one of our own scored a, a reversal in Texas Court of, uh, Court of Criminal Appeals, the highest criminal court in Texas, uh, as far as warrantless blood draws. And it, was, it came from the Supreme Court McNeely decision, and now we're getting kind of legalistic here. But uh, Tyler, tell me what, and Jim as well, what is a warrantless blood draw? And what happened recently in the Texas Courts of Criminal Appeals to affect warrantless blood draws? Well, the, the case that just came out is uh, Villarreal, and it's a pretty important case. I think it was consistent with the McNeely ruling. And um, basically, it's just saying that our, our Texas uh, warrantless, the mandatory blood draw statute has really come under scrutiny. Um, warrants are required on, on blood draws now, absent some other exception to a warrantless search. Uh, I think that exigent circumstances, meaning if there's some reason that it's um, an officer can't obtain a warrant that they can prove, and that's been very difficult for, for officers to prove in trial. I haven't really seen it, um, seen it much, but a warrant, it, basically it stands for the idea that a warrant is required now in all blood draws. Um, Villarreal did extinguish the implied consent um, argument saying, you know, the prosecutors will commonly say that when you sign up for your driver's license, you consent to give blood if you're ever asked. Um, but that's not necessarily true, and Villarreal dealt with that and said that that is, in fact, not an, an argument. Um, you have the right to refuse. And um, so it's interesting, though, the, I brought a couple other things. Uh, the dissenting opinion in Villarreal by um, 
Justice uh, Keller, um, she said that she equated um, a, bu a buccal swab, a DNA swab, as um, just as minimally intrusive as a, a stab with a needle. Um, so we're talking about Fourth Amendment searches here, and they're, they're supposed to be uh, by the least intrusive means possible. Well, I could probably find anybody in this room that would be willing to let me swab the inside of their cheek with a cotton uh, Q-tip, but probably not as many to stick them with a needle. And she said, you know, uh, sticking um, somebody with a needle, drawing their blood, that's uh, it's painless. It's, there's no trauma. It's relatively... Uh, um, no, it's not a traumatic experience and is similar to that of a, 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 a Q-tip swab for a, a DNA test. Which means she's never had her blood drop. Probably. <laughs> or she's never had children. Yeah. We've got a shot. Um, right. I, I want to talk a little bit about how to defend a case because we've talked about the elements that, that lead up to the arrest. We've talked about kind of what to do in certain situations, but what can a person do after they get charged? They go hire a lawyer. Because I, I, I always tell people, and I'm sure you guys do, the client is the best person who can help out in defending their case. The lawyer's part of it. And, and I want to get you guys' thoughts on, on how you guys defend cases. But what can the clients do to really help the lawyers defend, especially in a DWI case? Huh. Well, it depends on, you know, once we review the evidence and review the state's theory on the case, you know, different, different situations have different angles that they're going to try to prove intoxication. So like you asked about earlier, there are certain those situations where a person's medical records, prior uh, injuries, problems with their knees, their neck, their back, uh, could be issues that, that could be of value to the defense. And of course, the, the client's job would be for to, to cooperate with us, to uh, go and acquire those records and bring them to us and let us review them and see if, if they would be uh, you know, legally helpful, things like that. Um, asking the client questions about you know, where they were, and sometimes there's video cameras or other kind of evidence that could show you know, if the person was drinking or how much they were drinking um, that the police officer didn't acquire. Um, receipts, credit card receipts, you know, different things like that that, you know, doing a thorough investigation, and I think most good lawyers do, um, to see just what there is that's available that helps, uh, you know, what's out there that could possibly hurt that we need to be concerned about. Now, you, Jim, you actually used intoxication as a defense in a case, and I think we have some video of that as well, but can you, can you share with us how you actually used intoxication as a defense? Well, it's pretty rare for Texas law to allow, you know, intoxication as a, as a defense. But, uh, you know, under certain limited circumstances, someone who's involuntarily intoxicated, it could be a defense to certain other criminal charges, uh, not typically to a DWI case. So that, that's pretty difficult. And there have been some cases that have addressed that. And, you know, it's, it's pretty hard to make that argument that someone is driving while intoxicated completely involuntarily. Um, the case that you're asking about is a case where um, it was a very unique case where a, a gentleman had a, not, with no knowledge, had consumed a drink that had uh, GHB in it. Um, and uh, he later found himself in a situation where he wasn't aware of what he was doing and he was involved in a pursuit with the police that lasted for 20 minutes, running red lights, uh, running, uh, you know, there were probably 15 patrol cars involved, a DPS helicopter, a uh, dog chase, and uh, it, it re resulted in a charge of aggravated assault on a police officer and felony evading arrest. And you were able to use intoxica involuntary intoxication by virtue of the, the GHB in the drink as a, as a means to get him acquitted. My the client came to me and just with total sincerity told me I had, when he saw that video, he had never seen that before. He did not realize that had happened, although he was the only one in the truck. Um, we consulted a toxicologist that was able to, um, we got a hair follicle test that showed that he did in fact have GHB in his system. Uh, we used the hospital records. Um, because of the pursuit situation, the, the sheriff's department had sent an attack dog after him. He ran into some woods, and the attack dog uh, tore him up pretty bad. And so we had hospital records to show that he had some symptoms of uh, central nervous system depression, which would show um, that you know the drug was active in his system at the time. And just uh, turned out that you know the physical evidence lined up with his explanation, and the prosecutor ended up. Uh, even with that video, you know, he ended up dismissing the aggravated assault charge and the evading arrest charge on that he really, you know, didn't know what he was doing because of he had been uh, intoxicated uh, against his will or against his knowledge. Great work on that case. So we, have, we have another phone call. Uh, let's try and get one more call in here. Hi, welcome to HCCLA Reasonable Doubt. What's your question? Uh, my question is, uh, how does felony DWI conviction affect the right to purchase a firearm? Could you discuss that? And I'll hang up and listen. 
I think your question is how does a felony DWI conviction affect your right to purchase a firearm? I think that's it. I think, I think, it. I think, yeah, I think up, but yeah, anybody can it. answer that question here at this table, but if you're a convicted felon, you're not allowed to possess a firearm and several other items that are prohibited. It, you lose significant rights um, if you suffer from a felony conviction, and so it's worth uh, defending those cases very aggressively. Uh, Tyler, what does it take to elevate a DWI to a felony, or what, what makes a DWI a felony versus a Class A or a Class B or Class C? But no, it's not Class C. Well, probably one of the most common ways is to have two prior convictions. Um, there used to be a rule that they were, had to be, um, if they were 10 years apart, then they couldn't count as, pri as two priors, but that rule went away uh, several years ago. So you could have one conviction from 1970 and another one from 2000, and then the next one would be a felony, it would be a third offense. Uh, but also, this happens a lot of times, is um, if you, it can be a first offense, never been in trouble for anything before, and if you're driving um, with a child who's 14 years or younger in the car, that's, a, that's automatically a felony as well. Guys, we got a couple minutes left here, and I want to just very quickly get each of y'all's opinion on the future of DWI prosecutions. I mean, we, we've seen in a relatively short period of time us go from, you know, no test, no accident DWIs to complete no refusal every night here in Harris County. Where, where does it go from here? Just real quick. Uh, that's hard to predict. Um, it seems like I think auto manufacturers might come into play down the road, but the, nothing moves very fast with that kind of technology. It seems like there would be more um, auto safeties in place that would maybe cut down the, on the amount of dr drinking and driving. But for right now, um, there's no immediate changes in the future. The only thing that's coming up is they're getting ready to, to replace um, the breath test machine with a newer version, which then would call into question all of these current <laughs> breath tests being used in evidence. So. Jim, what about you? Do you see anything in the future that we should be aware of, both as, as citizens who could potentially be arrested and as lawyers? Well, in Harris County, you know, it seems like it's almost gone as far as it can. You know, getting a blood test in every case where a person doesn't just voluntarily give the police evidence of how much alcohol is in their system. Um, and uh, as Tyler was talking about, you know, there's talk about a technology of, a, of like a passive alcohol detection system built into cars that's like built into the steering wheel where just by you sitting there breathing and talking, if it detected a certain amount of alcohol, the car wouldn't start. Um, that's really more of DWI prevention, and, but that's yeah. kind of the, the next thing that people are talking about that, that inevitably, you know, the legislature is going to be requiring possibly on cars like they did seat belts, airbags, the third brake light, things like that. Well, I want to thank you guys uh, for coming and, and giving us your expertise on DWI. And uh, I want to thank everybody who joined us tonight and sent us questions, callers, everything. We are going to be off next week. We'll be back December 18th where we'll be talking about Ferguson, about New York City, and the grand jury processes in general. Till then, take care and see you next time. So the lesson is don't bleed, don't breathe.